I'm Amy Eisenstein, and I'm thrilled to have Stephen Shattuck with me here today, my friend and colleague from Bloomerang. He's the Chief Engagement Officer at Bloomerang, and today we're going to talk about Diamond in the Rough Prospects. So welcome, Stephen. Yeah, thanks for having me. What are Diamond in the Rough Prospects? What do we mean by that? I think they're people in your database that you should be paying more attention to and maybe that need a little bit more stewarding or that you've been doing a great job stewarding but aren't quite giving at capacity, and maybe we can get some more money from them. Great. How do we find them? Well, there's there's lots of different data segments, right? And and I always start with first-time donors because to me they're still prospects, and even though they've given, they've only given once, right? So I don't think we should you know be throwing a party for ourselves necessarily, <laughs> especially when you look at like the the average donor attention rates for first-time donors are high 20s, low 30s. So we lose a lot of them. So. I, I recommend people pay special attention to the first time donors so that they become multiple year donors and then maybe can get on you know major gifts and bequest tracks over the years. Yeah, so when you say pay special attention to them, what do we mean by that? You know, I think maybe fundraisers fail to be curious about new donors, mm. specifically why are they giving. And to me, that's something that I would naturally ask anytime someone donated to my organization if we didn't know them, yeah. you know, what is the reason? You could find out that maybe they had a grandmother who, who died of Alzheimer's or maybe they had a daughter who went through the program or something like that. Finding out those little stories I think can guide your efforts as you communicate to them you know, throughout the, the course of the relationship. Yeah, and I know that it's time consuming, but that just means picking it's, up the phone, yeah. sending an email. Yeah, and some of it can even be automated. I mean, I've seen online donation um, sort of things where they, you make an online donation, then there's an automatic survey that's given to them. And it's simple, why did you give? Why are you passionate about clean water, animal welfare, whatever it is? And you can get those little tidbits of information and suddenly base the whole communications track around uh, what you learned from that donor. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I didn't think of automation, but absolutely, yeah. right? And it shouldn't take place of the things you mentioned. I mean, nothing is going to replace a phone call or, or a one-on-one -on -one meeting, but I think you can at least get the conversation started that way. Yeah. So, okay, let's move beyond first-time donors. Let's say you do have some donors, maybe lower-level donors, people you don't know in your database or you haven't thought about. Yeah. How do you find them? How do they stand out? What are we looking for? Yeah, there's lots of different data points. Monthly donors is another big one, and it's sort of separate from the gift amount, right? A $5 a month monthly donor, I think, in a lot of ways, is, is more significant than someone who gives you know, maybe $50 a year. But we, we see that gift amount, and we think, oh, $5, that's not that much. But they also gave us a credit card that mm -hmm. they trust us with charging every single month or withdrawing from the checking account. Um, we can forecast that revenue. Uh, so to me, and there's a lot of date research that backs this up, I think uh, something like s they're seven times more likely to leave a bequest regardless of the gift amount that is the monthly transaction. So paying attention to those people. And monthly donors, they don't get treated very well typically. They get this perfunctory automatic message every month, here's your receipt, here's your end your statement. So telling those donors what the story of, of their impact of the gift is, um, and, and working towards you know, maybe upgrading them or getting a 13th gift that is a one-off gift, that's a really nice kind of compounding signal. Um, but beyond monthly donors, it's getting those other little factors, like they donate and they volunteer, mm -hmm. or they donate and they fundraise for you, or they donate and they spread the word about you somehow on social media. So looking for little multiple engagement signals is way more significant than the actual gift amount or maybe even how often they give throughout the year. That's great, yeah. so important. So we started uh, talking before the interview yes. about lapsed donors. As we usually do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were catching up before the interview. So let's talk about lapsed donors and how organizations know when to release them from the mailing list. What should organizations be doing with their lapsed donors? Yeah, it's hard. I think one quick answer to that is don't call them lapsed donors to their <laughs> face, right? They yeah. may not think that they are lapsed even though they think that, or even though you think they're lapsed. It's kind of like major gift fundraising, I don't have to tell you, but you know, right. major gift to you is not the same as what it is to the donor. It's true. Um, and I think the same kind of essence is there, right? You know, I think you have to look at what happened before the lapse? Did they give once in lapse? That's a different strategy than did they give for 15 years in a row and then lapse, yeah, right? Yeah, totally different. That's a way different thing that you want to do with that. 
Um, maybe they moved and you lost touch with them. Maybe they passed away, right? So there are things we can do to cleanse our data to maybe do an NCOA once a year or, or other data What's services. What's an NCOA, just in case so, people don't know? Yeah, so that'll help you, that'll check their, um, their mailing address versus the U.S. Postal Service uh, database. So right. if they moved, they may still really like you, but <laughs> they moved away and you lost touch. Um, but yeah, I think you know, some common sense things come into play. You know, if they gave uh, $5 during some online day of giving or if it was a peer-to-peer -peer campaign or maybe a memorial gift, you may have to work harder with those lapsed donors to kind of reintroduce yourself. They have been, may have been giving on behalf of someone, right. um, but if someone was loyally giving to you for a long time and then stopped, I, I wouldn't get rid of that person out of the database just because it's been a couple of years. I would maybe reach out to them, um, maybe send them a survey. You know, did we do something wrong? You know, a yeah. donor satisfaction survey. Well, yeah. if somebody's been giving for 10 or 15 years and then stops, you better pick up the phone. Absolutely, right? so absolutely. So it's a question of what reports are you running to identify those people and how yeah. are you flagging them in the system? Exactly, but even if you do that, come at it with kind of a, a, approaching it with a sense of gratitude for the past giving rather yeah. than, hey, what's going on? You haven't given, you know, <laughs> we miss you. It's kind of in between, but it, it still kind of puts the blame on the donor, right? right? Rather than maybe we messed something up. So what are some other things that people should be looking for, constituency indicators that mm -hmm. development directors can be looking for? Yeah, I think one thing is if you're a hyper local organization and you suddenly get a donation from way out of town, mm -hmm that may tell you that maybe you have a, a former service recipient that uh, has, has gained capacity and wants to give back to you. Okay. Now, I pick up the phone and call that person for sure. Yeah. Uh, there was an interesting study from uh, the Lilly School of Philanthropy, I believe, that found that the surviving children of deceased longtime donors are great prospects, which makes sense because they were probably, you know, they were in the household. I'm sure that that passion passed on to them for sure. And the other thing is, Amy, if someone reaches out to you um, with, without you prompting them and tells you that they are moving and they have a change of address or that they're getting ready to change their credit card, yeah. circle that person because yeah. they didn't have Star, to do that. circle, yeah. highlight. Absolutely. I mean, you just saved all the money on the data services, but they want to keep in touch with you, right? And yeah. they didn't have to do that. They want to be getting your information and they want to maybe continue their monthly gift or whatever it is. Yeah. Circle that person for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Any parting thoughts? Any key takeaways we can leave our viewers with? Yeah, I would concentrate on those first-time donors and the monthly donors. Yeah. Um, you know, common sense comes into play if you have a high gift volume, but I would recommend maybe not caring so much about the gift amount, at least to start off the relationship, mm. um, because that that may not be necessarily a marker of their generosity or passion for you, maybe just their, their capacity. Right. So it's just about reaching out to those first-time donors with a special email, special handwritten note, phone yeah. call, whatever you can do yeah. to really reach out and, and touch them and ensure they make that second gift. Absolutely. And find out why they gave. Yeah. Because that's going to guide your conversations going forward. Perfect. Asking them what motivated them to give in yeah. the first place. You yeah. got it. Great. Excellent. <laughs> thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. For even more videos, interviews, tools, and resources, I hope you'll visit my website, amyeisenstein.com, and subscribe to my weekly newsletter.